So this morning, before we get into the Word, I just really want to encourage you, because the topic that we're going to be dealing with for the next couple of weeks um, is a very, very serious topic, and I believe that the enemy is really going to try to distract our minds, okay? So I really want to be, I really want you to be alert and focused on what God has for us for the next couple of weeks. And um, if you were here last Sunday, as I began to speak, I talked about how there is a principality of witchcraft in Bellevue. Um, This is something that is a fact. There are many witches in Bellevue that are performing ceremonies and and, and sacrifices. Um, you know, a lot of times the church is very naive and they think that witchcraft isn't taking place and that witches and people that are not for the church, um, that they sit around and do nothing. But that's not the facts. Uh, I'm going to say something that's probably going to be very controversial to a lot of people, but... Um, People who worship Satan more times are more committed than Christians are because they'll spend hours and hours and hours when we get, uh, after about 30 minutes, we start getting uncomfortable and we want to go, we want to go eat lunch and people are going like this to the preacher, okay? And um, so... I talked about how there's a principality of witchcraft. You know, Ephesians 6 and 12, we know the scripture, right? It says that we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but we wrestle against principalities, rulers of darkness, spiritual wickedness. What is a principality? A principality is an area that is ruled by a prince. That's what a principality is. And um, so for the next three weeks, I'm going to be talking and teaching about witchcraft. I'm going to be talking about the different forms of witchcraft. I'm going to be talking about how we overcome witchcraft. And as we share and talk about this, I want you to understand, I mentioned this last week, even though we know that this is going on, it's not something that we should be afraid of. It is something that we need to be take serious because we know that he that is in us is greater than he that is in the world. But... We, we have to understand that we are fighting a serious battle in the spirit realm that's going on 24-7. There is no rest in the spirit realm. There's something happening all the time in the spirit realm. And um, when I made the decision to teach on this for the next several weeks, immediately I started becoming under serious attack. Um, and I don't think that that's coincidence. And so... Um, I want to pray as we get into this this morning, and I want to ask the Holy Spirit to help us. So would you bow with me? Father, we just come before you right now in the name of your Son, Jesus. We just thank you for your presence in your house this morning. Father, I need your help. Lord, I feel the attack coming against me right now. And Lord, we just press into your presence this morning. And in the mighty name of Jesus, we we just come against and rebuke all demonic spirits who come to distract, pull our minds away from what you have for us, And we just boldly declare this morning that we are ready to receive from you. Lord, it is impossible within myself to be able to articulate this this morning the way that you've put it in my spirit. I'm asking, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would guide my speech this morning, that every word that comes out of my mouth would be guided by your Holy Spirit and not by my flesh. Lord, I pray that you would open our eyes this morning to the battle that we're in. Lord, not that we might become fearful because we know that God does not, that you don't give us a spirit of fear. 
but power and love and a sound mind. Let that, Lord, we would be able to understand the seriousness of the day and the hour of which we live and the attack that's coming against us. We know in and through you, Lord, that we are victorious. But, Lord, you've called your church, Second Chance, to be an end times remnant church. And we want to be focused on the vision that you've given us. And we want to defeat the enemy as he comes against us in your church. Speak to us this morning through your word, Father, I pray. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen. So for the next three weeks, I want to talk about the subject of witchcraft. I want to give you this morning the Webster Dictionary of this word witchcraft. It says this, to use or practice the, sor- of sor- of the use or practice of sorcery, black magic, rituals, and practices that incorporate spells, potions, divination, fortune telling, tarot cards, etc. That's the Webster Dictionary version of this word witchcraft. Witchcraft is everywhere all around us. You know, nowadays you can go into your local stores and you'll find books everywhere on witchcraft. I shared a couple of pictures before when I was teaching on this. Um, this picture that I have up here right now is from, how many of you have ever heard of Joanne's Fabrics? You ever heard of, of that store? Okay. This, these pictures that I have um, were spotted by someone who attends our church when they were at Joanne's. And... Um, I want to point out some of these books to you. Uh, The Book of Spells, Basic Witches, The Healing Power of Witchcraft. You see this? The Healing Power of Witchcraft. All kinds of tarot cards, all kinds of uh, horoscope type of things. Folks, you can go into any store anywhere and find this type of material sitting out in the open. It's everywhere. And the enemy is just infiltrating society with this. And we know that the enemy always wants to provide a counterfeit of what God does, right? So we see this book, The Healing Power of Witchcraft. So that's the Webster Dictionary of this word, witchcraft. But I want to I give you a definition um, from the late Derek Prince. How many of you have ever heard of Derek Prince? He's really the OG, if you will, of deliverance ministry. And he defines witchcraft as this. And this is important because this, we're gonna, this definition here is what we're going to be working towards for the next three weeks, Okay. He defines witchcraft as an attempt to control a person 
and make them do what you want them to do by any spirit other than the Holy Spirit. Did you catch that? An attempt to control someone and get them to do what you want them to do by any spirit other than the Holy Spirit. It's going to be very interesting the next couple of weeks because as we get into the different forms of witchcraft, according to what the Word of God says, we're going to see that many of us in here probably many times um, are operating in witchcraft and we don't even know it. I want to read to you a scripture this morning that's found in Deuteronomy chapter 18. Because we find throughout the Bible that witchcraft is forbidden in scripture. Deuteronomy 18, 9 through 14. The scripture says, when you enter the land that the Lord your God has given you, do not learn to imitate the detestable ways of the nations there. Let no one be found among you who sacrifices his son or daughter in the fire, who practices divination or sorcery, interprets open, uh, omens, engages in witchcraft or casts spells, or who is a medium or spiritist, or who consults the dead. Anyone who does these things is detestable to the Lord, and because of these detestable practices, the Lord your God will drive you out those nations out before you, you must be blameless before the Lord your God. Verse 14, the nations you will dispossess, listen to those who practice sorcery or divination, but as for you, the Lord your God has not permitted you to do so. I want to read to you Revelation chapter 21 verse 8 that says, but cowards, unbelievers, the corrupt, murderers, the immoral, those who practice witchcraft, idol worshipers, all liars, their fate is in the lake of fire. And the Bible over and over and over again strictly forbids witchcraft. It's, it amazes me how many people in the church will actually, I've, I've talked to people over the years in the church that will actually go to a psychic to try and get some information. Folks, I want, to t- I want to tell you, in the same way that the Holy Spirit works in and through our lives, where sometimes the Holy Spirit will give us a word of knowledge to speak to someone or gives us discernment on something, these psychics and these people, they are operating through the knowledge of demonic spirits that are speaking to them. And when we go to something like that, we are opening ourselves up to demonic attack. I've known people in the church that will, 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 won't leave their house in the morning time without reading their horoscope first. That's demonic, folks. And we're sitting here this morning, and as I said, we're going to look at the different shades, the different forms of witchcraft and many of you might be sitting here and say, well, I'm good when it comes to witchcraft because I don't go to psychics, I don't read tarot cards, I don't, I don't you know, seek out those types of things, and I don't do potions and spells and, and all of this stuff. But this morning I want to talk specifically to you about one of what I believe to be one of the most subtle forms of witchcraft. And it really is found in a word called rebellion. And what is rebellion? Rebellion is disobeying authority. I want to read a verse to you this morning. It's one verse, but after I read that verse, I really want to give you the history and the story behind this verse. The verse is found in 1 Samuel chapter 15. Verse 23, when the prophet Samuel speaks to King Saul after he has disobeyed God. 
He says, for rebellion is like the sin of witchcraft and arrogance like the evil of idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, in other words, because you have rebelled against the word of the Lord, because God has given you a command and you've chosen not to do it, because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has rejected you as king. Now that's one verse, and many of us have probably heard it many times. It says, for rebellion is like the sin of witchcraft. Now, I want to give you the story behind this verse. Why did Samuel say this to King Saul? And I want to give you a quick little history lesson. And we'll go back to Exodus chapter 17. If you have your Bibles, flip over to Exodus chapter 17. And before I read this verse, I want to give you a a quick little story here. Is that um, Moses is leading the Israelites out of captivity from Egypt. And As they are coming out of captivity, uh, the Israelites are attacked by a group of wicked people called the Amalekites. It was an unprovoked attack. They came against God's people. And this is the story in the Bible where Moses goes and he stands up on the mountaintop and he lifts his hands. And as long as his hands are up in the air, the Israelites are winning. But when he gets tired and his hands start to fall, the Amalekites start to win. And you'll read in the story how two men by the name of of, of Aaron and Hur go up on the mountaintop and they hold up Moses' hands. And the Israelites Uh, win this battle, but I'm going to tell you something. God was not happy with the Amalekites for coming against his people. And I want to read to you a verse found in Exodus chapter 17. This is right after this attack occurred, verses 14 and 16. Then the Lord said to Moses, write this on a scroll as something to be remembered and make sure that Joshua hears it because I will completely, one verse says it like this, I will utterly Blot out the memory of Amalek from under, the, uh, from under heaven. Moses built an altar and called it uh, and called to the Lord. Uh, the Lord is my banner. He said, for his hands were up, up in the throne of the Lord. The Lord will be at war against the Amalekites from generation to generation. Okay, so God says, I want you to write this down. I want you to remember it because the day is going to come when I'm going to utterly and completely blot out and destroy the Amalekites for coming against my people. Listen, folks, let me tell you something. You don't want to come against God, and you don't want to come against God's people. Because God will always look out after his people. That's why the Lord says, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. It's not up to us to take vengeance, because God will always take care of his people. So God tells him to write it down, to remember it, because the day is going to come when he is going to completely and utterly destroy this wicked people called the Amalekites. Now fast forward a couple of hundred years, and this is where we are. I want you to go back to 1 Samuel chapter 15, and I want to read to you verses 1 through 3. Samuel said to Saul, I am the one the Lord sent to anoint you king over his people Israel. So listen now to the message of the Lord. This isn't coming from the prophet. This is coming from the Lord. He's, the message is coming from the Lord, but he's using the prophet to speak it to the king. This is what the Lord Almighty says. I will punish the Amalekites for what they did to Israel when they waylaid them as they came up out of Egypt. Now go attack the Amalekites and totally Destroy everything that belongs to them. Do not spare them. Put to death men and women, children and infants, cattle, sheep, camels, and donkeys. God's serious. Now that might sound harsh, but God said in his word back in Exodus, he said, I am going to utterly blot out the Amalekites for what they did coming against my people. Now, he sends the prophet to go to King Saul and says, this is what I want you to do. I'm giving you strict uh, orders here. He says, I want you to wipe everybody out. 
Men, women, children, infants, donkeys, camels, everything. Don't spare anything. You're going to utterly take them out. Those were the directions. So let's skip down now to 1 Samuel chapter 15. And I want to read verses 7 through 23. Then Saul attacked the Amalekites all the way from Hevelah to Shur to the east of Egypt. He took Agag, king of the Amalekites, alive. And all his people he totally destroyed with the sword. But Saul and the army spared Agag and the best of the sheep and cattle. The fat calves and lambs, everything that was good. These, they were unwilling to destroy completely. I want you to remember that. These, they were unwilling to destroy completely. But everything that was despised and weak, they totally destroyed. Then the word of the Lord came to Samuel. I am grieved that I have made Saul king because he has turned away from me. And has not carried out my instructions. Samuel was troubled and he cried out to the Lord all that night. Early in the morning Samuel got up and went to meet Saul. But he was told Saul has gone to Carmel. There he has set up a monument in his own honor. And has turned and gone uh, to Gilgal. When Samuel reached him Saul, uh, Saul said the Lord bless you I have carried out the Lord's instructions. But Samuel said, what then is this bleeding, bleating of sheep in my ears? What is this lowing of cattle that I hear? Samuel answered, the soldiers brought them from the Amalekites. They spared the best of the sheep and the cattle to sacrifice to the Lord your God. But we totally destroyed the rest. Stop, Samuel said to Saul. Let me tell you what the Lord said to me last night. Tell me, Saul replied. Samuel said, although you were once small in your own eyes, did you not become the head of the tribes of Israel? The Lord anointed you king over Israel, and he sent you on a mission saying, go and completely destroy those wicked people, the Amalekites. Make war on them until you have wiped them out. Why did you not obey the Lord? Why did you pounce on the plunder and do evil in the eyes of the Lord? Now listen to what Saul says. But I did obey the Lord. I went on the mission the Lord assigned me. I completely destroyed the Amalekites and brought back Agag, their king. The soldiers took sheep and cattle from the plunder, the best of what was devoted to God, in order to sacrifice them to the Lord your God at Gilgal. But Samuel replied, Does the Lord delight in burnt offerings? And sacrifices as much as in obeying the voice of the Lord. That is powerful right there. To obey is better than sacrifice. And to heed is better than the fat of rams. There, then we pick, off to where, pick up where we launched. For rebellion is like the sin of witchcraft and arrogance like the evil of idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, the Lord has rejected you as king. Folks, I want us to see this morning how serious God is when it comes to obeying him and his word. And let me just say this. We... We, the human race, are masters of coming up with excuses when we don't obey God. That's what Saul did. He said, well, I, I did obey God. We took the king, we destroyed everything else, and we brought back this good stuff to sacrifice to the Lord your God. That was not the instruction that God gave him. He said, don't spare anything. And the prophet replies, to obey is better than to sacrifice. And let me tell you something. When God gives us instructions, God is not an almost God. 
He is not a 95% God. When he gives us instructions, he expects us to carry out those instructions and do exactly what he tells us to do. But when we don't do it, we are masters of coming up with excuses of why we haven't done it. Well, God, I'm going to do that, but this is, this is, this is the angle that I'm going here. Y'all following me with, I'm, with what I'm saying here this morning? We will come up with all kind of excuses of why we don't step up and be, and be obedient. Rebellion is disobedience to authority. And the prophet says that rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. It's as the sin of witchcraft. So Saul rebels by not obeying the Lord. I want to ask us this morning, including myself, what are we rebelling against? What has God said to us that he's telling us, this is what I want you to do, and we're not doing it. We are walking in disobedience and rebellion. It's quiet. The scripture says that rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. Why is rebellion looked at as the sin of witchcraft, I'm going to tell you why, because who is the, what is the origin of rebellion? Where did it come from? Who was the first one to ever rebel? It was Satan. Rebellion was birthed out of Satan. He was the first to ever rebel. We see this recorded in Isaiah chapter 14. Now, the scripture says that this is a prophecy to the king of Babylon, but we also know that this is referring to Satan. Isaiah chapter 14, if you have your Bibles, turn with me there. How you have fallen from heaven, O morning star, son of the dawn. You have been cast down to the earth. You have who once laid low the nations. You said in your heart, listen to this, I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit enthroned on the mountain of assembly, on the utmost heights of the sacred mountain. I will ascend above the tops of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high God. He says, I will do this. I will do this. I will ascend. I will make myself like the most high God. Flip over to Ezekiel chapter 28. Again, this is a a prophetic word that they say for the king of Tyre, but we also know that this is also uh, talking about Satan. Ezekiel chapter 28. Starting at verse 13. There, there's, you know, some, some uh, theologians debate, what, is this really referring to Satan or is this really just the pro- prophetic word to the king of Tyree? But listen to how this starts off in verse 13. It says, you were in Eden. Was the king of Tyree in Eden? No. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone adorned you. Ruby, topaz, and emerald, and chrysolite, onyx, and jasper, sapphire, turquoise, and beryl. Your settings and mountings were made of gold on the day you were created. They were prepared. You were anointed as guardian cherub, for so I adorn you. You were on the, the holy mount of God. You walked among the fiery stones. You were blameless in your eyes from the day you were created till wickedness was found in you. Through your widespread trade, you were filled with violence and you sinned. So I drove you in disgrace from the mount of God and I expelled you, O guardian cherub, from among the fiery stones. Your heart became proud on an account of your beauty and you corrupted your wisdom because of your splendor. So I threw you to the earth I made a spectacle 
of you before the kings. Satan was the first to rebel. He said, I'm going to do it the way I want to do it. You know, God will not share his glory with no one. We talk about this word witchcraft. And most people just automatically their mind goes towards this, you know, casting these spells and doing these potions and riding around on a broom and all this other stuff. But there's so many forms of witchcraft. And listen, if we are living and actively, willfully sinning and doing what we want to do every single day, I'm, I'm telling you that you are walking in rebellion and disobedience. And the Bible says that that is like the sin of witchcraft. When God's word gives us commands and says, this is how I want you to do it. But we say to ourselves, no. I'm going to do it this way. I'm going to do it my way. I'm going to do it my flesh way. Are y'all with me this morning? We see how Satan was the first to rebel, and we see how in the garden he confronts God's creation. And his goal was to get them to rebel against God as well. And the tactic hasn't changed all these years later. Now, you've heard me say this many, many times, and most Christians should know this, the devil is not omnipresent. He can only be at one place at one time. You know, so when people say, well, the devil made me do it, well, that's questionable if it was really the devil. Because what, what does the Bible say? That each man is tempted and drawn away by his own evil desires. These demonic spirits operating are coming against the people of God and trying to get us to do things the way that we want to do it rather than the way that God wants us to do it. Because that's rebellion. That's disobedience. Think about this for a minute. And I want to ask you the question this morning. What is it that you are willfully doing right now in your life that God has been telling you, you need to get rid of that? You need to stop doing that. The Holy Spirit's been speaking to to you saying, nope, that's not right. Stop it. Stop it. The Holy Spirit's screaming, stop. No, no, no more. But if we are continuing to do it, we are willfully choosing to disobey God and rebel against what he's telling us to do. That's a form of witchcraft. Y'all looking at me like I'm crazy. I didn't write that. Don't you know that the enemy, I told y'all this last week, that not only is there a principality of witchcraft in Bellevue, I know this, I'm, I'm not going to go into the story, but this has been confirmed to me by, by multiple people, that there has been an assignment in the spirit realm of witchcraft against this church. So today, the first week, as we open this up for the next couple of weeks on witchcraft, I want to ask you this morning, 
are, are we walking in rebellion and disobedience to the word of God? What is it that the Holy Spirit has been speaking to you saying, I want you to get rid of that in your life? But maybe we've made the decision that we're going to keep it because we enjoy it. What is it that the Lord has spoken to you to do, what he's called you to do? He's given you clear directions to do something, but yet you've decided, I'm not going to do that. That's rebellion, that's disobedience, and it is as the sin of witchcraft. Let's go back to the definition that Derek Prince says about witchcraft. Attempting to control a person and make them do what you want them to do by any spirit other than the Holy Spirit. Don't you know that there are demonic spirits that are coming against the people of God trying to manipulate your mind, to try and control your mind, to try and lure you away from God, from what God has called you to do, and they're trying to get you to do what they want you to do. To sin against God. To do the things our way instead of God's way. Y'all looking at me like I'm crazy this morning. We have to understand what's going on and what's happening in the spirit realm. We have to be able to have discernment to know what type of demonic spirits are coming against us and against our family and against the church. We can't be naive to the Word of God, and we can't be naive to what's happening in the spirit realm. We've got to pray and ask God for discernment and for wisdom to open our eyes of what's going on in the spirit realm. And when we recognize what's going on, we need to take the authority that the Word of God gives us against these demonic spirits. We need to come out of agreement with them. We need to renounce rebellion. We need to renounce disobedience. And we've got to come out of agreement from these demonic spirits that are trying to manipulate our minds and trying to get us to do what they want us to do. We got to put our feet on the floor first thing in the morning and say, Lord, I, I surrender my life to you. My life is not my own. Today I will walk in accordance to your word and what your Holy Spirit wants me to do. I will deny myself. I will deny my flesh. I will not listen to any spirit other than the Holy Spirit. Because there are many, many demonic spirits that want your ears, they want your ears. They want your ears, they want your eyes, they want your mind. That's why the Word of God says walk in the Spirit and we won't gratify the sinful desires of the flesh. That's the only way we can do it, folks, is walking in the Spirit. I told you just a a, a month or two ago about a a, 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 uh, a church right here in Marion County where the pastor is teaching false teachings. He's, he says that Satan does not exist, that there are no fallen angels, that there is no hell, all these things, and that, you know, everything's just hunky-dory. That's exactly what the devil wants you to believe. If I make the decision, if I make the decision that I'm going to willfully disobey God, when God is saying, Steve, I don't want you to do that anymore, and I say, well, I'm going to do it anyway. Rebellion has entered into my heart. Disobedience.
And I walk into God's house carrying rebellion and disobedience with me. We've got to understand the seriousness of this. God gave King Saul instructions, and King Saul decided to do it the way that he wanted to do it instead of the way that God wanted him to do it. And the word of the Lord says, because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has rejected you as king. Now, folks, listen, please don't run out of here today and take this out of context because we know that we're all humans, we're all covered in flesh, and we know that we fall and we mess up and, and, and we, we, we get it wrong a lot of times. And that's why we have uh, forgiveness through the blood of Jesus to fall on the face of our faces before the God and cry out to him and repent and ask God to forgive us. And he's faithful and just. The word tells us that if we sin and we repent, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sin. But I, I just want you to see how willful disobedience affects not just the person, but it affects the people around them. We see this operating in, in the church all around. Whether it's, you know, rebellion happening within the body, rebellion happening from the pulpit. What, why do you think the enemy wants to fight the church so bad? Because we're, we're trying to do what God's called us to do, right? So the enemy's going to try and come against leadership, against people in authority in the church, coming against the people. That's how the enemy works, As we close today, I want to encourage each one of us, starting with myself, that we need to come out of agreement with rebellion. We need to renounce it, come out of agreement with it, repent for it, and surrender ourselves fully to God. My prayer this week has been that God would bring to the surface and show us any area of our lives where we've been living in rebellion and disobedience. For some of us, it may be crystal clear. We may be having some type of activity going on in our life that God is saying, cut it off. There may be others that the Holy Spirit just needs to show you an area that you're being disobedient in. Whatever it is, when the Holy Spirit shows us, we have to renounce it, repent of it, and say, God, I surrender every area of my life to you. Because Saul did about 95% of what God told him to do. But it was the small portion of what he didn't do that cost him being the king. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. Next week, we're going to look at three other forms of witchcraft that the Bible shows us. And I want to encourage you to be here because um, in Gal one of the areas that we're going to look at in Galatians where it says that the works of the flesh are these, and it names the works of the flesh, one of those works of the flesh is witchcraft. And if we go back to 
what witchcraft is, trying to get someone to do what you want them to do by any spirit other than the Holy Spirit, many of us are operating in witchcraft through manipulation, through flattery, through whatever, trying to get our wives to do something that maybe we want them to do, or trying to get our husband to do something that maybe we want them to do. Fill in the blank. We're operating in it. Y'all, are, y'all, do y'all not like me? So I want to encourage you to be back next week, all right? We've, ta- we've, ta- we've taken photos of everybody that's here. If you don't show up next week, we're going to know what's up. Just, just, just kidding. We don't, we don't do that here. <laughs> that's manipulation. And we don't manipulate people. <clears throat> Bow your heads with me, and I want to ask the prayer team to come on up and get in position. Just a few minutes, I'm going to close this out with a word of prayer. Once this prayer is over, these altars are going to be open for anyone to come down for prayer. Whatever you may need, if you need healing in your body. Doesn't have to be specifically for rebellion or or anything like that. Just anything that you want prayer for, these altars are going to be open. We'll anoint you with oil. We'll pray over you. If you're not coming down for prayer, I ask that you would just quietly and reverently make your way out into the foyer. You can fellowship out there. If you're a first-time guest, please stop by our Welcome Center. We've got a gift for you before you leave today. I just want to say thank you for being here today. We have a Revelation study Tuesday night. We have the Spiritual Boot Camp Workout Monday night. Intercessory Prayer Wednesday night. Freedom Friday on Friday night. And don't forget to stop out and check out the flyers out front of the Jesus to Muslims. They've got all kind of teachings going on at local coffee shops. I want to invite you to come out and be a part of that. Stephen and Karen, who are some of the missionaries that we support here at our church, that are doing a great work for the Lord. Father, we thank you for your presence here this morning. We pray, God, that your word would just challenge us this morning to be more like you. Lord, I ask, starting with myself, that you would show us any area of disobedience in our life or any area that we have willfully chosen to disobey you. Any area that we may be walking in rebellion. And Lord, as you show it to us, I pray that we would renounce it, repent of it, come out of agreement with it, and totally and completely surrender ourselves to you. Father, I ask that you would go with each one of us today as we leave this place, that you'd place a hedge of protection around us, that your Holy Spirit would guide us throughout the week, that we could be your hands and your feet in our community, that we could share the love of Jesus wherever we go for your glory. We thank you, Father, and we ask it in the mighty name of your Son, Jesus. Amen.